this morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are right now. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce um, Juan. And Juan, if you'd be willing to spend a couple moments at the beginning just telling us a little bit about uh, who you are, the type of work that you do, as well as the, the package and software information that you're going to be covering, that would be great. I know that people are excited to hear a little bit about your background as well. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We're super excited to hear what you have to say, and I will turn the floor over to you. You should have screen sharing permission if you want to share slides or anything like that. And feel free to tell people to either put questions in the chat or jump in uh, or anything else that you want to share up front. So thank you again for coming out today. Yeah, sure. Um, so just give me one minute because I really would like to have Silva here. Ah, yes, I think Absolutely. he's here right now. Ah, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because he has made lots of contribution to the package and I would like him to, to present them. Oh, okay. So, okay, um, uh, my name is, yes, my name is Juan Sebastián Ulloa. Um, so I'm, I have backgrounds in electronics engineering and I did my master's in electronics engineering, working with sensors, but I always wanted to adapt all this technology for biodiversity conservation. So I made my PhD at the Natural Museum in Paris, uh, where I worked with Jérôme Sueur and Thierry Aubin, uh, developing tools for uh, passive acoustic monitoring. And that's where I met Sylvain. Uh, I think you can introduce yourself, Sylvain. Yes. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm Sylvain Auper. I'm uh, from uh, France, from Paris. Uh, uh, I work now in Ecoacoustics for three years uh, and I started to work in Ecoacoustics uh, at the same time as uh, Juan was finishing his PhD. Uh, I'm also uh, an engineer, a biomedical engineer. <laughs> and I, I, I uh, <coughs> translate from uh, ultrasound imaging to uh, to acoustics for ecology so i'm i'm not, i'm pretty new in that field uh, but uh, i'm happy to to work in, in ecology <laughs> yes so we met uh, more or less in 2017 and this is where we began to discuss that we really needed to make uh, a package in python for a passive acoustic monitoring. And this is where our presentation starts. And just a last word, right now I'm working as a researcher at the Humboldt Institute in Colombia. Um, and I'm still developing all these tools uh, for biodiversity monitoring. So I hope you can see my screen. Yes, right now we're seeing yes. Um, okay. Window. Okay. So yes, so so we began to discuss with Silva, and uh, we wanted to make this package that we call Psychidmat, and its aim is to make quantitative soundscape analysis in Python. As I said, of course, uh, we worked together developing this package. We also know I worked with Juan Felipe La Torre that helped us a lot to make all the documentation and other functionalities of the package. And Thierry Oba and Jérôme Sueur were working, uh, were also pushing us to, to really bring up this idea uh, into life. So this is the developer team. Um, just a few words of backgrounds as you, surely know uh, the use of passive acoustic monitoring for ecology and conservation is growing rapidly uh, this is based in programmable sensors that can automate the acoustic data collection so these are the sensors that can remain on the field during days weeks months and even years and of course it's a cost efficient method to sample the acoustic environment this is a sample, just a word also, all the figures that you will see 
are made with the package uh, and you will have the links to replicate those figures. So um, this is a spectrogram, uh, for example, that we installed in the Putumayo region. This is between the Amazon and the, the Andes. And as you can see, this is the frequency. This goes from zero to 24 kilohertz. And you can see lots of different signals coming out. This is more or less 30 seconds of audio. And this is a long spectrogram that goes from uh, midnight to 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and again, midnight. And this is more or less all the information that we are collecting, which is amazing. But still processing the avalanche of audio recording is still challenging and represent nowadays a major bottleneck that slows down its application in ecology and conservation. So to develop, when, when I began my PhD, we discussed with Jehom how to develop new ways to analyze uh, these soundscapes. So we work on this analysis that we call multi-resolution analysis of acoustic diversity. That's where math comes from. So it uses 2D wavelet analysis and unsupervised learning to estimate the acoustic diversity in tropical soundscape. At that time, I was really familiar with MATLAB, so we developed everything in MATLAB, which MATLAB is amazing, it's an amazing tool, but still it's paid. So my reflection was, okay, I'm, I'm going to finish my PhD and I will have to buy a license to continue using the tools that I developed. So as uh, we discussed with Jehom, with Sylvain, we said, okay, we, we need to translate all the code to an open, source, an open source solution, which facilitates the reproducible research for science, democratize the access to state-of-the-art developments, promotes and facilitates collaborative research. And <clears throat> of course, you can adapt the code to your own scenarios. An example of an open source software is Audacity that I'm sure that most of you know and use frequently on your research. So we said, okay, let's develop something. And we were, of course, we, we looked at different solutions. And the first idea was to develop something in R because most, ecologists use R and they are familiar with R and there are also other very nice packages packages in R to to analyze sound like C wave like warbler like monitor but still we we had some struggle to find uh, some basic functions that allow us to make uh, the 2D wavelet analysis. So we continue looking and we found Python, that Python had all these tools. It has, uh, okay, it's open source, but it also has lots of different libraries for numerical analysis, like NumPy, like SciPy, that's uh, is where you can find the 2D wavelet analysis, like pandas like matplotlib to plot um, all your results. And we think that Python can bring to the ecoacoustic community additional benefits from this package. And it also offers a suitable environment for scientific computing, signal processing, and pattern recognition. I also have to mention here uh, the amazing work of scikit-learn, that's another library uh, frequently used for machine learning. And so, so we also looked, uh, if you look a little bit on, on the web and, and search for, because if you, you don't want to spend all your time developing something in a language that uh, is not very popular, but Python has been growing very rapidly during the last 10, 15 years. And in fact, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineer 
said last year that learn Python, that's the biggest takeaway we can give you from its continued dominance on I triple E spectrum channel interactive ranking of the top programming languages. So all new technologies are being developed in Python and you can access them if you learn Python. That's uh, also maybe an advice for some of you, if you like to program, if you like to program in R, you would have a complement if you know Python. I'm not sure if you can, how many of you work with Python already? Is there someone that has worked with Python? Besides Silva? I'm starting to use Python because, well, actually what you said, like many tools have been developed there. And Marcelo, I have a name there, I should say. <laughs> In my name. Hi, Marcelo. Yes. Okay. Yes, I know that you've, you've been developing lots of tools in R. And uh, nice to hear that you can also, I think there are other tools in Python that are very interesting. Uh, okay. Okay. Yes. And I think there's uh, more and more people will turn to Python. This was something that we, we were not sure if, if we wanted to move the people from R to Python, but really, since we had all the uh, base functionalities in Python, it was very, very, uh, it was easier for us to develop the package in Python. So that was the main reason. And we developed, so uh, this toolbox that's called Scikit-Mat, a toolbox for quantitative Thank soundscape you know. analysis in Python. I, Ned. Terrible. Okay. Um, so we we also uh, discussed some design principles. Uh, we wanted a flat package layout that facilitates the transition for R and MATLAB users. We follow the PEP8 coding style. Python has some coding styles, uh, and this is one uh, of the major. Um, coding styles. We also dedicate a lot of time for building a comprehensive online documentation that I will present later. And we work on interchangeable modules to give flexibility in the analysis. And of course, we provide all this with an open source license. These are the main modules that we have so far. Uh, we have sound that's for loading and pre-process -pre and transform the audio. Uh, we have a module called uh, regions of interest that's used to segment uh, the audio. That's something that we frequently do. And then you can compute features. Of course, uh, you can go from sound to features directly if you want. So this is all modular. Uh, we also have, um, some modules to connect this digital world with the physical world. And this is the SPL module that's used to estimate some pressure level and active space that's used to compute the detection distance of sounds. So let's get into these modules a little bit closer. So sound, for example, uh, all this you can, you can compute all this uh, with a single line of code. Uh, so you can load your sound. Uh, we have some audios that are uh, delivered with the package. So you, you can play with them. Uh, so you, this is the module sound load. You can compute the envelope, you can compute the spectrum and you can compute the spectrum. Okay, this call is a, a, a series of songs of Cranioleuca erythrops, that's a spine tail. And for example, with the same audio, you can, you, you sometimes need to segment the audio. So find the regions of interest on, in your audio signal. You can use a very simple 
segmentation method. That's also a one line code and to detect these regions where the bird is singing. And we have some more advanced segmentation methods. These are two dimensional segmentation methods that allow you to detect the regions of interest, but not only in time, but also in frequency. In the module features, we, we, we added nearly 60 of the most popular acoustic indices. You will find uh, how to compute this. This is very easy to, to compute in, in batch processing. And we also added this 2D wavelet analysis. That's another way to characterize sounds. So this just sometimes most of people ask me, uh, what do you get with that? So you, just to make it simple, you get the shape and texture of the spectrogram. So you have this call, this is the same call that we've seen of, of the spine tail. And you use the spectrogram and you, you use these filters to compute the, the, the wavelet coefficients. And what you get is that you have some coefficients that are small, that are, um, that are oriented vertically. So these are these small vertical lines. And you also have some uh, information in the horizontal, which is in the horizontal axis, which is the time, which is much larger. And this is why you have also a little bit more emphasis in these coefficients. Okay, and this one, which also indicates that there is a larger coefficient in this frequency axis. Sylvain, your turn to present yes. the models. <laughs> the, so I work mostly on the physical part of the circuit mad uh, package. And the first uh, sub-module uh, is a SPL for some pressure level. Uh, you can estimate the sound pressure level of acoustic events. You can uh, transform your raw audio data into dB uh, SPL. Uh, so you can turn your uh, uh, SM4, for instance, into a pseudo uh, um, sound pressure le level um, uh, device. Uh, you can uh, also uh, compute uh, from the raw audio data the continuous sound pressure level, which is the integration of uh, the sound pressure level over time. We lost Sylvain or it was just me? Uh, it happened for me also. We can give him a moment and see if he pops back. I appreciated the inter or the explanation on the front side. That's nice. Yeah, and maybe we can we, we can take some questions Absolutely. Uh, while Sylvain joins us again, if you have some question about Python, uh, about what I presented earlier. All I can say. So Sylvain is back. Yeah, I'm back. Uh, it's terrible. I don't know why my, it's always the case when I have to do something. So I am on my smartphone and even though it doesn't work. So sorry for this. Uh, so you can do, you can, um, you can uh, estimate the sun pressure level in time, but also in frequency, which is quite interesting. As you can see on this picture, you can uh, estimate the frequency, the um, sun pressure level at different frequency range. And on this picture, you can see that uh, the maximum uh, sound pressure level is between zero to one kilohertz uh, during the whole day, uh, while you can see the, the down chorus and the dust chorus where the sound pressure level is uh, increasing and decreasing during the, the whole uh, uh, 24 hour cycles. 
Uh, this is quite simple to, to perform, to, to use, because you, it only requires recording settings and record their parameters, such as the microphone sensitivity that you can find in on the uh, manufacturer uh, data sheet. Uh, you need the gain and the peak to peak voltage uh, of the uh, analog to digital converter that you can also find on the uh, uh, data sheet of the material of the device. Uh, Juan, could you go to the next slide? Yes. So uh, you can also perform, this is a, a new module uh, from the last release 1.3 of scikit-mad. So it's called the active space and you can uh, estimate the active or detection distance. Uh, so you can compute the geometric and atmospheric attenuation, which is quite common, but you can also uh, compute the habitat attenuation, which is a kind of new uh, way of, uh, uh, of estimating the wall attenuation uh, done by the habitat like a forest. And we knowing that, I think we love Sylvain again. While we wait for him to come back, do you have any suggestions for people who haven't used Python before that might be inspired to move over and try Python as good entry places or? Yes, so this is part of, of the idea behind this package is that if you are using R, C-Wave, Warbler, this kind of tools, I think you will find quite easy to move to, to Python using scikit-mat to, to run your analysis, analysis. Not all of them. This is more focused on passive acoustic monitoring. So we still don't have, for example, uh, functionalities to measure precise uh, temporal patterns of some songs. We might develop them in the future, but this was more focused on passive acoustic um, recordings. So, but, we made, we, we made the effort to, to make this comprehensive documentation, to make simple function, functions that you can use uh -huh. uh, while you learn Python, when you begin to, to learn Python. I'm not sure if Python is if, if yeah, back. back. I'm back, I'm okay, sharing, okay. Uh, I don't know, it's, it's crazy. I, 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 I almost finished, so <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. So knowing the, 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 all the attenuation, you can uh, estimate the detection distance depending on the output sound level. If you know that the bird is, uh, has a, a call at uh, 80 dBs, for instance, and uh, the frequency content of the ambient sound because everything is not, everything is, um, is, uh, is uh, dry, driven by the ambient sound level. So that's it. And here we have an example of uh, uh, a sound at uh, white noise at 80 dBs uh, in the tropical rainforest. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, between seven to eight kilohertz, uh, the uh, distance the detection distance of the uh, recorder is very, very low due to the insect uh, stridulations. Yes, so so not you don't have the same detection distance for all frequencies. That's important. Exactly, that's important, and it's mainly due to the ambient sound level that differ that that, that changed uh, uh, during the, the the whole day and during the uh, seasons. Mm -hmm. So that's and you also point. have this. Uh, so, this trend that's very go on uh, one. <laughs> yes. Okay. And you have also this trend that, that shows that uh, high frequencies are also more attenuated. Um, and also, I wanted to I want to mention that this all this I think is very important for uh, all of you that are working with passive acoustic monitoring. If we begin to give also our results in in absolute dBs, that makes uh, easier comparison between sites. For now, I think most of our studies are being developed uh, in a relative way. Uh, so it, it's a little bit harder to compare the results between sites. And I think this can be an interesting step forward to, to make uh, more general analysis between sites. 
Juan? and between studies. Juan or Sylvain, can you say a little bit more about what the inputs are in this one? Like you go out with the white noise unit that is presumably like an, a known characterized amplitude and play back the sound or what are the raw data going into this? It's Silva. Okay. Uh, sorry, the, the, I'm back again. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's crazy. So it should be fine now because I'm on my computer. It works now on my computer. So sorry, what was the question? Oh, no, that's, I was just asking if you could say a little bit more about what the data inputs are for the active space calculation. Are you going out and yes. conducting playbacks of a, a predefined sound or how is that? So, Oh, yes, yes. So, so, so to, to, to estimate the habitat attenuation, uh, you need to go outside, yes, of course, and uh, to, to, uh, to play back a white noise uh, at different distance. And then uh, it's not that difficult to extract uh, just a single value that defines the wall habitat attenuation. Uh, and then you can use it to uh, estimate the distance of propagation uh, or the diffusion distance or the active distance, depending on if you are uh, an animal or, uh, <laughs> or uh, an acoustic device. And uh, for this, uh, you need uh, to know the ambient sound uh, when you, well, if you, because if you want to know uh, at which distance you can hear a sound uh, at midnight, it's not the same than during the dusk chorus or the dawn chorus, where you have a lot of noise, for noise, a lot of sound, <laughs> a lot of sounds. And uh, also during the, the, the winter, it's not the same than during the, the summer and so on. Uh, so uh, you need to know some stuff like that, but, but it's not that difficult. And Are you using... Like, Oops, sorry, go ahead. sorry. I was going to ask if you're using a characterized speaker or microphone. Like, can you use? Uh, you need uh, so for the microphone, you don't. By, in fact, you want to to characterize your own microphone. So you just need to use your own microphone, uh, like uh, the SM4 or uh, the Cornell box. <laughs> uh, if you, for the for the speaker, uh, it's uh, better to. Uh, use a flat speaker or to try to flatten your speaker in order to, uh, when you uh, send uh, 80 dB uh, flat white noise, uh, you want to have uh, the, the 80 dB uh, spread on the wall uh, frequency from, let's say, uh, 10 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So you need to know the frequency res uh, response of your of your, um, of your device. But this is not that difficult if you have a, uh, a sound, uh, uh, sound meter, and so on. Yes, a sound meter as a reference. Uh, that's, yeah, that's the, the, the requirement. Uh, yes, that's it. But what I saw, what I saw is that uh, the, the, the habitat attenuation was quite similar uh, for two different, um, uh, two different forests, because I did that in uh, in French Guiana, so in tropical rainforest, and also in, in temperate uh, cold forest in France. So without uh, really the same uh, type of trees and uh, the same vegetation and the same, uh, of course, the same uh, population of birds. But at the end, the habitat attenuation parameter was somehow the same. And in fact, in the literature, in the literature we can see that somehow the habitat attenuation is about the same where you are in the, uh, in the closed area, uh, closed habitat, like a forest. They are, they are not so, uh, very different. Of course, there are some differences, but it's not like huge. So you can kind of use a, a uh, an average habitat attenuation for, uh, and it's a good start to predict the detection distance. So that's the main, the main important part. And don't forget to, to also use the, uh, to apply the atmospheric and geometric. Uh, geometric, no, no one uh, forget to use it, the geometric attenuation, but usually people, they forget to uh, apply the att atmospheric attenuation. And this could be huge too, the, the, the habitat attenuation. And everything yes. should be almost uh, published. 
Uh, I hope so, finger crossed, because I just uh, submitted the article uh, today, so we'll see. But normally, if everything goes well in a few months, everything would be online and uh, the paper, the examples and everything would be easy. Yes, amazing, Sylvain. So, so yes, this is these are all new developments, and I, as Sylvain said, I think this is very nice to begin to think how we can contribute to have all these attenuation coefficients for different habitats. I think if, as, as Sylvain said, the differences are not huge, we could use some models to to know this, um, to have like a reference to to have this idea when we make these uh, monitorings of species or different animals. So, um, uh, well, nothing, yes. Yes, quickly. that's true. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> yeah, yeah, still. <laughs> uh, yes, of course, uh, when you know the, the attenuation law, you can also simulate the attenuation at different distances. And here it's still the same uh, spine tail sound. And uh, it's the original one at 10 meters. And uh, you can simulate the attenuation at uh, 50, 100, and 200 meters, for instance. And you can see that. The background remains while the uh, spine tail song decreases. And first, the highest frequency, you lose the highest frequency first, and then the, the lowest frequency uh, at uh, 200 meters away from the, from the source. Voila. Yeah. Voila. <laughs> and of course, uh, just uh, the, you have some interesting links here that I will send to the distribution list. The first one is um, the GitHub account. I'm not sure uh, if you have used GitHub before. I, it's a very, very nice tool to share code. Um, so you have all the information of the package is here. You have even the documentation. If you want to see specific uh, functions you can you can go here so everything is here all this is open source and we also have here what i sent to you uh, the news about new release uh, that we made this 12 days ago the new release with the active distance and some other functionalities here you have all the information for sound for the module util spl etc so we made all uh, this public and you also can send if you have some issues you can send your your issues here and we will read them and we'll try to fix it uh, and hopefully also with your help we make uh, we can improve our package so where was i okay and the other link is the documentation that i talked before so you have um, easy installation instructions, what you need, uh, how you can install this, the standard installation that I think it's what most of you will use, but of course all contributions are welcome. So if you want, uh, or if you want to be up to date with the new developments, you can uh, make this installation. And you have some quick start, as you can see, these are one, two, three lines, four lines of code where you can start to see uh, how it works. You have all the information divided by the, by the modules. This is the module sound. Uh, and you have all the functions here. Uh, you can see the details, how you can use this function. Uh, I think this is really help, helpful for all of you that haven't used math, but also for us, I think I, I see the documentation very, very frequently. Uh, and we made also something that I think will help you is this example gallery. So for example, detection distance that we were talking before, this is the same graph that we showed and you have all the information uh, of what to do, how to do it, uh, how to compute the detection distance. Uh, you have some, this is, these are the basic examples that 
are, for example, just to begin with, I, I, we would recommend to begin with this, uh, very few lines of code. So you should not have any issues with this. And some more advanced uh, users, this integrates, for example, also scikit-learn using non-negative matrix factorization to decompose this spec program into different bases and to plot uh, a false color spectrogram that uh, differentiate the different kinds of sounds. You have, uh, you have, for example, the simulation that showed Sylvain how, how to make all the simulations of sound attenuation. And uh, what else will we have? Okay, yes, the installation is very easy. So it's usually it's pip install scikit-mat. We recommend like using uh, because this is this is the the line of code because uh, Python our package uh, scikit-mat it's uh, here in this Python package index. Here is where we push all the new developments. And so you use pip install scikit-mat, but we recommend using also Conda, which is another um, toolbox manager. And you can install other stuff with Conda and then use Conda pip install scikit-mat to install scikit-mat. Um, so, and we release, this is, of course, this is uh, something that uh, we are improving each day. So, we launched uh, this year the version 1.3, which includes the module active distance, which also includes this API wrapper to download Zenocanto recordings and metadata, and also load manual annotation from Audacity and Raven, and more. I, I will send you the, again the, the link to, to check all the new features. I'm not sure if you want to, to comment a little bit more about this. Uh, API wrapper, Silva. Um, How it works? Not, well, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's um, so uh, it's uh, it's uh, easy uh, to use a uh, wrapper. It already exists uh, in R with um, Warbler R Warbler. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a bit the same. Uh, you can download. Uh, you can you can uh, uh, ask uh, queries to to Xenocontos to get the metadata of the of the sound files that you you that you request, and then uh, from this you get a large uh, data frame with all the informations, all the metadata uh, that are on uh, on Xenocanto. And just from this, you can already do a lot of things, but you can, of course, uh, download the files that you want uh, from uh, after selection of the sounds that you want on the, the metadata on the data frame. So it's quite fast and uh, very easy to, to use. And there are two examples now in the documentation where you can use it uh, just to work on the metadata and uh, to work also on the recordings. And you can see that uh, with that you can uh, do a, a workflow from the yeah the the, the, the data that are, that is already uh, that is on on the web directly to uh, something that are relevant uh, in bioacoustics or in ecoacoustics. Yes, <clears throat> and so all this was new in version one by three. So just some takeaways. Uh, we really think that Python offers a suitable environment for quantitative sound analysis. Um, Scikit-Mat opens new links to other Python libraries also, so, such as Scikit-Learn, Scikit-Image, TensorFlow, and PyTorch. So the idea is that it can be, as, as I was commenting to Laurel, can be an entry point for most of you that use R C-Wave or Warbler, if you want to try Python. And then you will see that there are lots of different libraries that can be used. We did not, for example, we did not add any uh, machine learning algorithms of, or stuff like that because there were already other very nice 
tools like scikit-learn or TensorFlow or PyTorch. These two are for deep learning. Uh, so the idea is to use all the libraries that you have in Python uh, with scikit-math. And we invite all of you to become contributor. You can, for example, submit new features. And in fact, I would like to hear some suggestions here. Uh, what kind of new features would you like to see in scikit-math for version 1.4? And you can also, something that is very useful is report issues. Uh, of course, there are bugs like in any software development. So if you find some bugs, please report them in GitHub. Uh, and so we can improve the package together. The idea is to build this community effort, develop an ecosystem of open source packages for bioacoustic and ecoacoustics research. And we hope that the development gives the opportunity to create synergies between the large community of researchers that seek to explore, understand, and preserve the acoustic diversity of ecological systems. Thank you very much. Awesome. I forgot to add your, your email, Silva, sorry. I, or you forgot. <laughs> you forgot. Yes. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. You <laughs> you, you'll, you'll receive all the questions and all the suggestions, and you will have to cut <laughs> everything. <laughs> uh, OK, do you have any questions, uh, comments? Ideas, ideas to develop new features. Um, I have a question. One, um, well, that's very cool. Yeah, thanks for, thank you guys for working on that. Um, looking forward to use it. Um, um, well, one question is how easy it is to install that, and I'm not really familiar with Python, but my experience with other things like develop code or, or packages that have been installing things, sometimes it's painful due to conflicts for different versions and stuff. Okay, yes. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, yes, go ahead, uh, Silva. It's true, it's, it's true, it's true. But if you want to start, there are two ways at least. One is to use Conda to avoid the, the maximum of conflicts. And another way is to use uh, Colab from Google. It's, uh, uh, it's a Python, Py, um, Python um, uh, environment online. And uh, on this, you, everything is already installed and uh, it works because it's uh, Google. So they, they, they have already installed the PyTorch, uh, TensorFlow, scikit-learn and so, and so on, except for sure scikit-mad for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but you can install the scikit-mad on, on top of it. It's very easy. It's just one line of command and there is no problem. Uh, I've, uh, I've done that several times and it's a good way to start to use scikit-mad or any other packages, in fact, or anything, just to start uh, working with Python. Uh, it's to go on Google Colab, and uh, maybe it's the easiest way. You don't have to install anything on your own computer. It's everything online. And uh, then if you, when you are a bit familiar with that, you can uh, install some stuff uh, on your computer using Conda. That's, that, was, that would be my, my advice. And uh, you will see that in fact, it's quite it's quite smooth. <laughs> you don't have uh, a lot of troubles every time. Uh, so, yeah, would be my advice. Okay, thanks. Well, and the other question, I don't want to monopolize the question, but uh, can you give us? I think I have a very poor idea of what wavelet the composition is. Um, my understanding is like sometimes people have avoided because of the structure of the data and seem to have some triangular form because it's not the same resolution at different frequencies. That's what I understand, but I might be wrong. I don't know. You can give us some explanation for not um, math savvy people and also why is uh, better than other approaches for what you, you did. 
Do you answer one? Uh, I can give an answer. So yeah, good one uh, is you off. Is it? Go ahead, Silva. Okay, okay. So, uh, so yeah, it's wavelet. Uh, wavelets are behind that, but you can see that uh, as uh, just a filter, in fact. And uh, the the idea is just to to uh, to select uh, to 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 uh, to. Uh, Yeah, to select the to de determine where, uh, what is the main features in your in your image. So we, when you have the region of interest uh, surrounding a, an acoustic event, your acoustic event could be uh, multiple uh, pulse. So you the the wavelet that are sh short and long, uh, they will pick up this acoustic event, while the other wavelet they won't pick up anything. And uh, if the the, the 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 signal is like a, a horizontal one, like an harmonic, a single harmonic, long harmonic. So not the, another wavelet will pick it, this uh, will uh, uh, outline. Uh, no, no, uh, not outline. Uh, highlight. Outline. Highlight. Uh, well, voilà. I, I like the, <laughs> this. Uh, the, sorry, this, uh, this, uh, this signature. This uh, this acoustic event. So. The, the, they are sensitive to different uh, orientation of the acoustic event and uh, and different uh, uh, duration uh, of the acoustic event. And it's only the, this is the only the, the the easiest way to understand the how the wavelet uh, are used in um, ad, such as It's not like a uh, wavelet decomposition uh, uh, as a usual uh, usual way of. Uh, of doing this uh, decomposition of a sound by a wavelet. It's another way, it's more like using filter, in fact, uh, to highlight uh, the, 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 the direction of the, of the, of the signal on, 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 an, on an image. That's it. Yes, just to give an, another way to explain this, because uh, when we were working on how to, um, to classify all this kind of, of, of different sound types, you us we usually compute like uh, temporal and spectral features like okay how long is this sound and what is the frequency bandwidth and all this you can do it if you manually compute all these uh, features but for example in soundscape it's very hard to get all this information automatically so this is an, uh, a way to indirectly compute all these features that you have in your sound that are quite robust to uh, sounds that are not uh, close by, but more distant from your microphone. Okay, cool. Thank you. There's a question in the chat. Have you considered expanding the the distance estimation feature with direction estimation for microphone array recordings. No. And the reason, the, the main reason is that we don't use uh, any uh, microphone array. It's it's not our uh, way uh, of uh, yeah. We just work with one or two uh, microphones. That's the maximum. And uh, of course, if we you have an array, you can also do uh, yeah uh, direction uh, do some direction estimation. Uh, but uh, yeah, right now it's just simple, very simple because people they are working on with very simple uh, uh, device and because they are usually you can find some low cost uh, device like uh, audio mask less than one uh, hundred uh, uh, not thousand one hundred <laughs> dollars uh, and in this case you have just one my microphone and you can't do uh, any array and if you want to do an array then it's uh, complicated because you need to synchronize everything and it's no more like low cost uh, device and very an easy device to use 
I'm just answering another question that uh, they asked about Conda. Uh, I, I added the, yes, the link to, to Conda documentation where you can download and understand. This is just a package manager. So it helps you to install everything. You just have to put Conda install Python 3.9. Then you, you want to install some of the packages. You make Conda install NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, and scikit-mat, and it it helps you with uh, with this installation. It's very similar to the install dot library now. And if you and if you install directly scikit-mat, in fact, it will install also all the required package, so numpy, uh, scipy, and uh, pandas, and so on. So it's very very convenient uh, to use conda, but. Well, my first advice would be to use Google Colab. <laughs> uh, then uh, you can uh, recreate any, uh, every time you, you want a new uh, environment and try to use new library. And there are more and more uh, notebook because it's based on notebook, Jupyter notebook. And so it's easy then to download the Jupyter da da notebook and, 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 uh, and use it uh, directly on Google Colab. Yes, using Google Colab, you don't have to install anything. You, you just access some cloud services through your, your web browser. So you can, uh, you can even also have access to GPU, so free GPU, uh, and even TPU. <laughs> I've never used it, but uh, so it's, it's very interesting. And I'm pretty sure that most of the universities in the US, they, they have it. Uh, they could have access not for free, but they are, are, everything is already paid by the university or somehow. <laughs> so it's very, very, very interesting. Uh, I see also a question be, be, between active distance and active space. Yes, uh, the package is called, in fact, the sub module is called uh, active space, but and it's the same as active distance or uh, detection distance. In fact, it's just a matter of uh, vocabulary. <laughs> Uh, I know that space and distance isn't the same, but in the community, we, we, yeah, people are using both in the same way, uh, that uh, distance or, or space. But uh, of course, space is, a, is an area or, or, or a 3D volume, <laughs> but and distance is only 1D, but uh, it's, the idea is the same behind that. I, I see other question here. Do you have favorite tutorials or books to introduce newcomers to working in Python? Uh, no. <laughs> my, my advice would be to look for scientific Python because Python is like very a very large um, programming language. So you have Python for different uh, purposes. But if you look for scientific Python, you will have all this uh, information more targeted to what we usually did. For example, numerical analysis uh, and plotting and et cetera. And that would be the, the first steps. So yeah. the advice would be to look in Google scientific Python. And also, uh, if you are familiar, uh, you are familiar with R, uh, there are also some websites where they compare both languages. So just to translate what you know in R directly to Python, because it's not that different. Uh, of course, it's different, but not completely different. So yeah, not to be completely lost, uh, they, they can uh, provide you the easy example where you can see that uh, by changing a few things, you can adapt your R script into Python. Uh, I've done that from the paper that I've just submitted. Uh, everything was in R for the active distance, and I translated in, in Python, and I also mixed both Python and R on Google Colab, because in Google Colab, you can also do R, uh, use R. It's something that no, it's not very well known, but uh, very easily, uh, I guess it's by, uh, Adding, adding a dash R or something like that. Uh, you have to look, at, look for that on, uh, on, uh, on Google, but you can uh, uh, pass from Python to R uh, at every line of code, in every line, for every line of code. So yeah, I've done everything in Python, but then I converted in R and so on, and you can pass from one to the other one. 
uh, especially when you uh, uh, save your data in a CSV uh, file, for instance. So, uh, yeah, it's good to use both because Python is, all, is really very fast to perform uh, uh, signal analysis. Uh, or at Christic Index, uh, I've also coded everything in, in fine, everything, a lot of uh, uh, acoustic indices in R. Uh, and it was really, really slow. Uh, 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 slower, but slower. slower. Uh, I, I was like lower, slower. Yeah, it was really, really slower in R than in Python. Python is very fast. I know that you can also be very fast in R if you have some some stuff uh, coded in C plus plus or in C or so on. But, uh, but yeah, using Python normal Python and normal R, you, when you do uh, uh, signal analysis, it's really 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 faster. In Python. Yes, as I understand the the main uh, numerical analysis libraries that are is what we use like numpy and scipy have been optimized to we to use um, yes to perform quite fast so since we use that we don't have to make the extra effort to program in c++ or c and yeah. there's a yes there's another question uh, that's for you uh, from ross charif is the detection distance based on received relative level no received level relative to ambient background yes. yeah I, I answer yes <laughs> From the chat. yeah 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 it's it's totally based on that in fact because if you don't know the ambient sound you don't you don't know until when the the, the sound is below the ambient sound because that's the 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 the, the, the detection distance the the the, the uh, First approximation of the detection distance is when the sound is below the ambient sound. Of course, it's not as simple as that because there are clues, uh, frequency clues, uh, uh, other, other clues like uh, from a psycho audition and so on that uh, allow you to uh, detect sound that are below the ambient sound. But the basic idea is to work. Uh, the, the basic idea yes, is to define the, the detection distance for uh, for each frequency uh, to be the detection at which the, the the sound level is below the ambient sound at that frequency. Yes, and um, there's a technical question from Joshi Viral. It would be great if you tell a bit about requirements of processing power. I, I think, I don't know, you don't need much to, to run. Uh, yeah, uh, for instance, if you want to compute the 60 plus uh, acoustic indices on uh, one year of acquisition, one unit every 15 minutes, so it's uh, more than 100,000 uh, files, it will take uh, several hours, so it's okay. <laughs> I, I think it's okay. Yeah, we yes, and just we usually also I, I work with with the package with my personal computer, so there's nothing yeah. Uh, yeah, super yeah. Uh, fancy, and and I've I've worked with. Uh, terabytes of data, computing the indices, and yes, you have to keep them running, but it something is nice that is that usually it works very, very well. And you have the results, uh, you, you put them, you compute, you, you launch your script uh, in the evening and you have the results in the morning usually. Yeah. If you are, if you are computing lots of indices through many sites. Yeah, and also you can also optimize the, the, the computation time by using all your uh, CPUs. Yeah, usually when you do that, you just only use one CPU, but there is a way that is not difficult to use all your CPUs. 
There is no example for the minimum. Yes. But it's something that we can add. It's not something that we, we implemented. It's already implemented uh, in Python. And it's just a way of how to, uh, to call uh, the function to calculate uh, all the indices, for instance. And, uh, but it's just two, three lines of codes. So it's very easy to. Yes. To Usually our, our process our processes are very easy to parallelize because you compute the same thing on all your audio recordings. So that's something very easy to parallelize. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's very easy to parallelize without knowing anything about parallelization. Yeah. Should, should it work faster on Google Colab? Um, uh, I think they have a notion for GPU. Yeah, so with the GPU, you won't be faster because uh, you, uh, our functions, they work on CPUs and they are not optimized for GPU. Uh, so don't use the GPU, it's not necessary. Uh, GPU, it's uh, only good for, well, mainly, mostly good for uh, when you use PyTorch or, or um, TensorFlow. Uh, otherwise, for scikit-map, you don't need to use a GPU. And uh, they, you just need bare CPUs, and when you connect to uh, to uh, an, an instance uh, on Google Colab, you have a bunch of CPUs. I don't know exactly how many, but then uh, maybe it's four CPUs or eight CPUs. I don't know, but you can use all of them uh, to compute, uh, and it's quite fast. Yes, <laughs> also. But the, the main problem, in my opinion, because uh, I don't have uh, an access, Google access to a lot, lot of storage on my drive, it's the main problem is that is uh, you need to transfer all your data on the drive, on the Google drive or any other drive, so like Amazon drive or so on. And uh, this is the main, uh, the main issue because uh, you need terabytes of, uh, of, of, of space. Uh, because the, you can't work on your uh, data, on your data set that are on your local uh, local machine, local computer. So that's the main issue. But if you can deal with that, it's a good option. At least to start, uh, you don't need to <laughs> work on terabytes directly, <laughs> just on gigabytes, and <laughs> just to see how it works, and then it's, and it's quite easy. Well, I'm cognizant that we're coming up on the hour. Um, I want to thank you again for taking the time to come out and give us such a comprehensive explanation. It's a really cool package. There's some things in there that I have not seen done before, and it's interesting to think about the applications and uses of those approaches. Um, thank you also for answering our questions about the Python transition and different hardware and software platforms. So that's awesome and appreciated. Um, Thank you all, it's great to see you. And next week we will be on a quick spring break. So, or I'm sorry, the our next meeting. So two weeks from now, we won't have a meeting and I will also be on jury duty. So no meeting two weeks from now. And then we will resume um, the following regular cycle. So four weeks from now, um, and Xiam will be talking about his Python tool for training machine learning models from uh, data that the user provides. So that should be a, a fun one also and interesting to think about integrations there. So thank you all and take care. Thank you very much for the invitation, Laurel.